Good morning. Welcome back. And uh, thank you to the members of Voices of Change. That was Helen Blackburn Flute and Drew Lang Marimba offering Bob Beezer's Hush You By. Helen Blackburn is principal flute of the Dallas Opera and on the faculty of Texas Christian University. Drew Lang is on the faculty at Southern Methodist University. And cellist Kari Nasbachen, who you obviously did not just hear, uh, but will be joining us a little later, and she's a member of the Dallas Symphony. So let's have another big round of applause for them. And uh, you know, the piece you just heard by Bob Beezer was uh, written for Elliot Fiss, the guitarist, and Carol Winston's flute. And um, if you liked what you heard, Bob has an absolutely magnificent catalog of orchestral work. So he's a composer that if you don't know him, you would enjoy getting to know more of his work. Um, last night's concert, what can we say? It was just magnificent in every way, and our gratitude to the members of the Dallas Symphony, to Jaap von Schweden, Dave Hislop and the whole team for putting on last night's tremendous, tremendous concert. So let's give them a big, big round of applause. And um, the party, of course, is part of the whole experience. Um, it's it's a, a nice way to experience a concert, to have a, a nice big party afterwards. You get together with your friends and colleagues. And I'd like to extend a very special thanks to two women who worked very, very hard on that, Ann Blomeyer and Heather Moore and the Dallas Symphony volunteers. So uh, Heather and Ann, if you're here, can you stand so we can thank you? Okay, so here we are. This is our second general session, Driving Innovation, a Roadmap for Practical Implementation. And this morning's general session is co-sponsored by Arts Consulting Group and BigScore.com. Arts Consulting Group is a leading provider of hands-on interim management, executive search, fundraising and marketing consulting, facilities and program planning, and organizational development services for the arts and culture industry. What don't they do? They're terrific. They are represented at this year's conference by President Bruce Thibodeau, and senior consultant Rebecca Lambert. They are located at booth 506 in the exhibit hall, and please stand so we can thank you both. There they are. Scorebig.com enables live event fans to get great tickets for performing arts, theater, concert, and sporting events at guaranteed savings of up to 60%. Scorebig.com is represented here today by Vice President for Sales, Ken Lesnick, and they are located at table letter O in the exhibit hall. Ken, stand up so we can thank you, too. There he is. So this morning, our conversation continues uh, to the question of innovation. And some of you may be thinking, innovation, enough already. It's been drummed into us for years inside and outside the orchestra field, and I've got enough on my hands and barely sufficient resources to maintain the status quo. But this morning, we say to you, that's not good enough. It's tough work, but we and you need to take it on. We are all either agents of change or we're moving backwards. There is no standing still. Today, we'll offer two perspectives on innovation. First, Brent Asink, Executive Director of the San Francisco Symphony, will frame this challenge. Coming out of the San Francisco Symphony Centennial and their American Orchestra Forum, he will lay a foundation for how orchestras can stay true to their core while adapting to the changing realities of audiences and communities. Not an easy task. Then we will hear from Jeff DeGraff, a new voice for most of you. Jeff will bring his experience as an innovation expert and practitioner and offer us guidance on what it is we actually do as institutions and individuals to innovate. Now, please welcome our colleague and well-known, admired by many of us, Brent Asink. My 
my goodness, that's a long walk. Good, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Jesse, for those kind words. It's great to be with all of you here in, in uh, Dallas, beautiful, rainy Dallas. <laughs> so, San Francisco Symphony turned 100 this year, and I have one piece of wisdom to share with all of you. This was not a surprise. We knew it was coming. We planned it for five years. And for those of us who have had significant birthdays that have ended in zero, I would suggest to you that we tend to do one of two things, or sometimes both things, on that big anniversary day. We celebrate and we reflect. Uh, the San Francisco Symphony did both. And the part that was about reflecting really was the American Orchestra Forum, a chance for uh, us to talk with colleagues both inside the field and outside the field about various aspects of our lives together. <coughs> and this was supported by the Mellon Foundation. And we talked about three major themes. The first was community. What is and should be an orchestra's relationship with its community? Second was creativity. How do orchestras work creatively off the stage as well as on? And third, audience. How are we responding to our audience's changing attitudes and needs? These are all big questions and I'm gonna come back to them in a few minutes. But first I'd like to discuss with you the overall context of our theme today, which is, as Jesse said, innovation. Let's start by considering what that commonly used word means in our field and then get back to community, creativity, and audience. As Jesse said, innovation is everywhere. We hear about it over and over. It's a cover story of the Harvard Business Review. Um, and we will hear a lot more about it uh, later today. A major California foundation makes innovation grants. And just recently, our music director, Michael Tilson Thomas, declared that orchestras have an imperative to innovate. Back in March at the American Orchestra Forum session, Ed Sanders, who, is Google, uh, who as Google's uh, chief, ran the astonishing YouTube Symphony Orchestra Project, said, quote, the institutions that can be shown to be experimenting and pushing innovation forward rather than standing still are the ones who are going to survive. You can either be terrified by it or you can let go a little bit and see what happens, end quote. Let go a little bit. This is somebody from Google who says, let go a little bit. And as the symphony, San Francisco Symphony has looked back at its first century, we see that our orchestra and many others represented here today has in fact been an innovator throughout our history. We played a central role in advancing some of the key technological innovations of the 20th century. Radio broadcasts, recorded music, movies with soundtracks, live television broadcasts. These in turn pushed the boundaries of our art form in creative and dynamic ways. And as delighted as we are with that legacy of innovation, the rate of technological change in the world around us has accelerated, accelerated dramatically in this century and it is now we who struggle to keep up. It's worth reminding ourselves that only 10 years ago there were no iPhones, no YouTube, no Facebook or Twitter. How did we survive? As the rate of change has accelerated we face a mounting pressure to innovate in response to the impact these new technologies are having on every facet of contemporary life. We are finding ourselves trying to catch up. And this new level of challenge came up throughout our American Orchestra Forum conversations. Before we explore in greater detail what those conversations revealed, I want to ask a fundamental question. What does it mean for a symphony orchestra to innovate? We exist to perform classical music. It's what we do, it's who we are. Much of our deeply cherished repertoire and our rituals are rooted in the past and let's acknowledge they are profoundly loved by millions across the country. If we lose sight of that in the eager pursuit of innovation for its own sake, we run the very real chance of innovating ourselves out of existence. On the other hand, our rich traditions and histories can also constitute an impediment 
to adaptation. We heard yesterday from the UAW and Ford how they had to overcome traditional business assumptions before they could find a pathway to a viable future. It's not easy or obvious, but this question of how to balance our artistic legacy with institutional innovation is a critical one, and it's one that we wrestled with throughout our American Orchestra Forum discussions this year. I'm sure you all do too every day. So with this delicate balancing act as a backdrop, let's return to the fundamental themes of the American Orchestra Forum, community, creativity, and audiences. These are large concepts, certainly, and they often overlap, but each area also addresses a specific aspect of the imperative to innovate. University of Chicago cultural historian Neil Harris observed in our October forum, talking about communities, that we orchestras generally carry our city's name and were in large part founded as declarations of civic pride filling both an artistic and communal need long ago. Any self-respecting city in this country needed to have a symphony orchestra that carried its name. Fast forward to today, and those very communities whose names we proudly share are asking themselves, why do we have an orchestra? Whom does the orchestra serve? I'm sure there's not an orchestra represented here today that wouldn't answer that question by pointing to many of the following activities that we all do so well under the general name of community engagement. We partner with our schools to educate our children. We celebrate local heritage events. We invite amateur musicians as adults to return to music making. We play at sporting events, city parks, senior homes, and yes, even dance clubs and bars. But if you're like me, you still find that many in our communities are unconvinced. So then we ask ourselves in this crisis of self-confidence, doesn't our community value Beethoven anymore? I believe that it does, but our communities are not connecting what we consider to be community engagement with what we also consider to be our core activity, and that's performing classical music in our concert halls. Our institutions are well-oiled machines delivering top-notch performances to audiences in two-hour chunks several times a week. But what appears to be a growing proportion of our communities is not so sure that's what they want. Some of them are completely accustomed to letting everyone know where they are and what they're doing at any given time and sharing how they're feeling about that experience in the moment. In this interactive YouTube, Twitter, Facebook era, shutting our audiences down electronically for two hours is giving them withdrawal anxiety. Yet I readily acknowledge the prospect of our allowing our audiences to remain plugged in produces considerable anxiety for many in our field, myself included. I spent far too much time on American Airlines yesterday, and I picked up their um, magazine, which I don't do very often unless I'm truly stranded on a plane, and they had a story in there about tweet seats, and the Nashville Symphony is quoted in that article as experimenting um, with that new, new uh, opportunity for audiences. Our institutions are well prepared to release highly produced recordings, error-free and critically acclaimed, while our audiences grow increasingly accustomed to accessing, curating, and sharing content for free and on demand in a way that they want to do it. These are all clear signals from our communities to us that the time has come to apply the same creative spirit that we bring to our music making to the concert and more broadly to the entire musical experience that we are offering. In a provocative blog post, American Orchestra Forum contributor Ben Cameron challenges us just as he challenged our entire industry at conference two years ago in Atlanta. He writes, quote, what if we saw our concert halls not as places that divide audience from artists, but as symphonic centers where we maximized every opportunity, uh, every opportunity to embrace the full range of symphonic activity, including but not limited to the traditional concert, end quote. In order for us to answer our communities convincingly, orchestras have to make this type of holistic thinking an institutional imperative. We must internalize it and make it central, not just to our mission statements, 
but to the nuts and bolts of what we do week after week. Reconsidering our rituals and practices will involve considerable creativity, flexibility, and I would add courage, which brings us to the audience itself. Our audiences are diversifying at an accelerating rate, and I'm not just talking about age and ethnicity, although demographically many of our cities are shifting rapidly. I'm also talking about diversifying musical tastes and diversifying interests and expectations in when and how to experience our music. There is good news in this. Our music is being consumed today more than ever before in our history via more challenging cha channels. The YouTube Symphony Orchestra concert I mentioned earlier drew over 30 million online and mobile viewers. But there are huge implications here for our core offering live symphonic performances. We discussed this at great length in our final orchestra forum, talking about audiences, which took place last month. One of our panelists, Elizabeth Scott, who spent 12 years at Major League Baseball Productions and now holds the new post of Chief Media Officer at Lincoln Center, observed that we in the performing arts have long held that we will say what our audience's experience will be, rather than saying, here are the different ways you might have this experience. And what professional sports have discovered is that they're making their content available across multiple media platforms has corresponded with even stronger attendance at live events, which, by the way, hold tightly onto their own rituals and happen at a time and place dictated by the organization. But, to quote Elizabeth directly, if you give exciting ways in through media, they will want to come into the hall. So, we are back to inviting our communities in. The walls of our halls must become more permeable and transparent. We must be willing not only to invite the outside world in, but allow them to interact with us and empower them to take us along when they leave. This will demand innovation across all aspects of our institutions. Our staffs, musicians, boards, and patrons, and donors must work together to accept that our communities and audiences' expectations are changing. We must find creative ways to ensure that the musical encounters we create are a vital part of living in San Francisco or Dallas or Ann Arbor. So how do we get there? I think, uh, as he often is, Jim Collins does have something to say about this, a great business scholar, who argues in his book, Built to Last, that long-lasting organizations fight what he calls the tyranny of the or and embrace the genius of the and. As he says, these successful enterprise, quote, preserve a passionately held core ideology and simultaneously stimulate progress in everything but, the, but that ideology. Preserve the core and stimulate progress. A truly visionary company embraces both ends of a continuum, continuity and change, conservatism and progressiveness, heritage and renewal, fundamentals and craziness, and, 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 end quote. I believe this is one of the keys to achieving balance. We must reject the false dichotomies that have been so central to our thinking, such as tradition versus innovation, excellence versus flexibility, artistic quality versus sustainable, financial sustainability, live performance versus electronic media, educators versus performers. We must find the means, both financial and persuasive, to embrace the genius of the and, keeping one foot firmly planted in our fundamental values while we let the other foot explore new modes for sharing them. Taken to extreme, that metaphor would have us all doing the splits. But I strongly believe, and the American Orchestra Forum conversations have reinforced that belief, that with practice and with the insights gained from talking to each other and listening to each other, we can actually achieve the flexibility that allows for the necessary calisthenics involved. To quote composer John Adams, who played a large role in our centennial and was a significant voice in the American Orchestra Forum, the only thing we know about the future is that it is bound to surprise us, end quote. But just as we went into our centennial season knowing it was coming, 
We don't have to face that future unprepared. Our past does ground us. Our present stimulates and challenges us. By developing a culture of greater flexibility and openness, we can blend the best traditions of our past with the dynamism of the present and forge a vibrant future fully prepared for the surprises that await us and using them to shape the orchestras that our communities so urgently need. Thank you.
I'm supposed to ask for another round of applause, but I think in order to do that, I'd, I'd like to ask the artists to come back out on stage. Helen and Carrie, can you come back out? Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, they were playing Gabriella Lena Frank's uh, four pre-Inca sketches, and uh, she too uh, has a wonderful orchestral catalog. And in, in listening to um, both pieces that um, we've heard from Voices of Change, it's hard not to uh, conclude that these were not just um, interludes in between uh, remarks by uh, our guest speakers today, but this also uh, is innovation right in front of us and arguably at the very, very core of our creative nature as performing arts organizations. And um, these two instances both um, very much expand the materials of, comp of composition beyond what we're familiar with. And also it's interesting that they both draw on indigenous musics into a more formal Western uh, structure. So we, we just heard uh, from Voices of Change two really wonderful instances of innovation and really at the heart of what we do uh, when composers and performers come together to extend and grow uh, our repertoire and expand what our audiences come to take in and absorb as new ways of experience the orchestral uh, repertoire. So that was, that was really a treat. Um, our next speaker is a world-renowned thought leader executive and innovation expert with over 25 years of corporate leadership experience as a clinical professor of management and organizations at the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. Jeff DeGraff has shared his experience globally as top innovation incubators and think tanks such as the Aspen Institute and with companies including GM, SPX, 3M, Apple, American Airlines, Coca-Cola, and GE. He is the executive director of the Innovatrium Institute for Innovation and Idea Lab and managing partner of the Competing Values Company, and, uh, and which is a top innovation consulting firm. Please give a warm welcome to Jeff DeGraff. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. All right. I want to start by saying I'm not an expert on symphonies or orchestras. I have to admit that to you. And it's interesting because if you're in the innovation field, almost every day, whether I'm working uh, you know, with, uh, with Apple or Coca-Cola or whatever, I, I'm, the, I'm the least uh, knowledgeable person about any particular area. What I'm going to talk about today, though, is the thing that I do know a lot about, which is how innovation actually works and how organizations grow and how they die because they don't innovate. So what I want to start with is I'm going to spend uh, our session today not giving you a checklist because I don't believe one size fits all. It never fits all. I'm going to work on instead your mindset because once you get a mindset about how to think about innovation, it becomes relatively straightforward. So I'm going to start today by tearing apart your most sacred notions about how innovation works. I know it's going to be really painful at the beginning. And then I'm going to give you some thought forms about how it actually does work and then finally, I'm going to talk about what you can do in your organization, in your symphony, in your town to make it work for you. I want to start with a radical premise. You know, we're talking all about do people care about symphonies and are we getting support? I want to start with a radical premise, and that is between 2008 and 2009, the cumulative annual growth rate of the United States economy was negative 37.9. I want everybody to get this, negative 37.9. Did it feel like a train wreck? It's a train wreck. At the height of the Great Depression between 1929 and 1930, it was 38%. It was a basis point, one-tenth of a percent less than the Great Depression. So I want us to start with this is where we're at. So anybody who thinks that things are going to be normal from here on out is delusionary. It's never going to be like this again. It doesn't mean that it's going to be bad. It just means we're going to have to, in our minds, change that construct that we're going to go back to anything that looked like it did before. Well, I want to start with the first premise here. Slides, please. I want to start with the very first premise, which is in a down economy, 
Innovation isn't your best friend. It's your only friend. You're either going to figure out how to do things better and new, or you're going to evaporate. That's the reality of the situation. Now, I get called a lot by these magazines for these beauty contests about what's the most innovative company or organization, in your case, in the world. But I want you to think about it for a minute. In your mind, what's an innovative company? But then I want you to take a second and think about why. What makes it so doggone innovative? And in fact, a lot of times, it's just a beauty contest. There really isn't anything tremendously innovative about it. Well, I want to give you a list that I think will, will be illuminating to a lot of you. And this is a list compiled by 2,700 C-level, meaning exec senior executives, in 70 countries around the world. So this isn't my list. This is the list of the free world. Now, I want you to look at the companies on here that they take to be the most innovative companies in the world. And I want you to notice a couple things. I want you to think about what kinds of companies they are, and I want you to think about how they innovate. So let's start with Apple. Does anybody remember that in 1997, Apple almost went bankrupt? Anybody remember this? Yeah, front page of the New York Times, Apple is dead. Yeah, well, they weren't so dead, were they? Why? Well, this is going to be the first big insight. Innovation happens in a down cycle, almost always, where risk of changing and the reward of changing is reversed. Or in the words of Bob Dylan, when you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. You got nothing to lose. You take the safety off and you play with a live round. You know, you're almost dead. Well, I want you to notice all the companies up here with checklists are companies that sometime in the past 15 years were almost dead. And these become our innovation juggernauts. We sometimes call this the Lazarus effect. So I want to start with a premise that a down market is not the worst market for innovation. It's actually the best. And I'm going to prove it to you in just a minute. I also want you to notice the companies that have frowny faces. These are companies that are currently having a lot of problems with innovation and are either going to grow and do something radically different or they're going to die. That's what's going to happen to these companies. Now, I want you to think about these companies for just a minute and think about how they innovate. So Apple, how much of Apple's own products do they make? None. They make the operating system. Nice business if you can get into it, isn't it? They're the most valuable company in the world, and they're a design company. I'm looking out my window this morning in my hotel room, and there's a big uh, iPad uh, ad. Have you seen it? On the side of a building, and it's in white. And I thought, well, thank God it's after Easter. You know, Apple now comes in white. It's like Vera Wang. It's a design firm, you know. And, and they've got a business model innovation. The, the music industry, you know, maybe some of the publishers are here, the 13 major publishers, thought that Apple would make $2 million a year when they signed the iTunes deal. They made a million and a half dollars the first day. They have 93% of the MP3 download market. The music publishers are now saying they're going to renegotiate that contract. When you got 93% of the market, it's going to be a can of whoop-ass, right? There's going to be no renegotiation. Yeah, Google. Larry Page was one of my students at Michigan. It's nice having a former student with $100 billion. Google, business model innovator. Microsoft, big, can you imagine Microsoft? Big blue, the infidel? Vista, the blue screen of death? Well, these guys made the list because they're a platform innovator, so everything talks to each other, right? And you go down the list, and what you're going to figure out very quickly when we look at this list and we study this, because the Innovation Index is something that I produce out of the University of Michigan, when we study this, you know what they have in common? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They don't run the same strategies. They don't run the same processes. They don't use the same metrics. They don't have the same human resource organization. They have nothing in common with the other 1,975 companies of the Fortune 2000. And in fact, when we throw out the heads and tails of this list, it doesn't even pay better than the S&P 500. So it means there isn't one way. So we're going to have to immediately start with, there's got to be something else. And don't, uh, don't resort to the old, oh, they're all entrepreneurial. Oh, that's helpful. Like, we can go home and do that. I want to add to this. This list in 2010, for the first time, over half the companies on the list are not American. 30 years back and forth to China. The rest of the world is here. Innovation is no longer an American birthright. 
We're going to have to reinvigorate this economy. We're going to have to reinvigorate ourselves. We're going to have to reinvent ourselves. Now, when we take the hood off of this, again, full of good news this morning, take the hood off of this, we ask people what they want from innovation. So there's a magnitude to innovation. So it's not just what, what innovation is, but how big is it? You know what most people wanted in this down economy? They wanted little tiny innovation, a little bit more innovation, teeny tiny innovation. Are they going to survive? Probably not. Isn't that what most of us do here? We just, we're just going to turn the dial a little bit. That's going to change it all. No. Did you, didn't you get the 37.9? Turning the dial a little bit isn't going to change it. Then we got this other piece, which is, oh, we're going we're gonna to go get a, a little, we're going to do a little more innovation for a few more people. But here's the interesting one. The interesting one is new to the world innovation. Radical innovation. Now, here's the question for you. Who throws the first punch in a bar fight? Is it the great big guy with the Budweiser jacket or the little guy with crazy eyes? <laughs> it's the little guy. Why? Because it's what we call first mover advantage. If he doesn't hit first, he's going to get the stuffing beat out of him. Now here's the point. There are those of you in this room that are 18 to 24 months away from being out of, out, of, uh, out of business, as we say. You've got to throw the first punch. You're the only one who's going to throw it. Now, we've got incumbents in this room. They're never going to throw the first punch. And if you benchmark them, which is the traditional way of doing it, it's like benchmarking the last person that's going to leave a burning building. You're going to be behind them. So you're going to have to look at who's likely to move first, because they also have nothing to lose. Is everybody following us? So we're going to have to turn our mindset upside down, but when we ask these same leaders what stops them from innovating, they gave us some really interesting things. One of the things I want you to notice about this is that the nadir of the worst recession in almost a century, what didn't make the list? Money. Now, I want to give you a little known fact. Do you know that American companies are sitting on somewhere between three and four trillion dollars, T, trillion, in cash. Companies have never had more cash. Now, the way you make money, if you're an organization and you're a senior leader, is you have to drive the share price up. You have to drive the options up. That's the only way you make money. So putting it in the bank is not really a successful strategy for anybody. Now, let's say half of that concern is what's going on in the world. The announcement out of France yesterday, a little relief, but who knows what's happening in Europe. So half of it's fear. But the other half is they're looking for things that are going to have the kind of breathtaking, game-changing results that doing things the normal way won't do. Now, I suspect that somewhere along the line, how businesses innovate and how money comes into your organizations has a corollary, and we're going to explore that. I also want to point out that since 1955, when the Fortune 500 was kept, we've been keeping this record, and guess what? Companies go bankrupt for the exact same reasons. They're slow, they're cheap, and they're unconnected. Incidentally, according to this same survey, what was the most innovative company in the world from 96 to 81? The Crooked E. Now, why is this a problem? Let's start rebuilding. The problem is that innovation is different from every other form of value in one fundamental way. It's time-based. It goes sour like milk. The stuff you bought for your kids last Christmas is crap by next Christmas. That's the nature of innovation. It's sometimes called the axe maker's dilemma. How much data is there on the future? What's going to happen with the Arab Spring, the price of the dollar? Anybody know? No, you don't. And you know what the number one form of resistance is? Excessive planning. Now, I want to talk to you because I've been listening to you at the tables last night. You're planning. Smithers, come here and planning, right? Planning, planning, planning. Excessive planning stops you from taking action. It stops you from pulling the trigger, from, from sending the ship, whatever metaphor you want to make. I want to start with a radical proposition as we start to build our mindset for innovation. And it goes like this. What if the key to tremendous innovation is not starting something? What if the key is stopping something? How many of you feel overcommitted in your organizations and personal life? Am I the only one? Anybody feel overcommitted? You're out of capacity. You don't have time for innovation. Of course you don't. 
because you're doing things that are taking your capacity. Now, here's the point I'm trying to start with, which is what if the real ability to launch something better and new, which is what innovation is about, isn't about starting something new. It's about stopping something that you took to be sacred. Now, this is going to be important because what I'm going to lead to next is going to be this important insight, which is everything in this world costs something. Anybody who tells you different is trying to sell you something or sleep with you, one or the other. Now, I want to start rebuilding this. This is called Hall's model of competitiveness, and I want to relate it to your life and to your industry. Hall taught at Michigan. I'm two generations behind Bill Hall, and I'm going to challenge Bill Hall in just a minute here. But Hall said there are two forms of innovation. There's relative delivered price for comparable quality, and then there's breakthrough uh, innovation, which is unique to a particular market. Those are kind of fancy terms. One means Coke against Pepsi, Huggies against Pampers, Camry against Accord. The other means, you know, if, uh, if uh, I develop Lipitor, which came out of my city in Ann Arbor, do I buy a new Mercedes or do I stay alive? I'm going to stay alive. And you can imagine the margins on the one are huge and the risk is huge, and the margins on the other are smaller and the risk is smaller. Well, let's look at an industry that we deeply understand. I want to start by looking at uh, our friends at Apple, who actually, Steve Jobs actually followed this model for years. And think about it for a minute. When the iPhone came out, do you remember what happened when their competitors lowered the price of their handset? He gave re rebates back to people. Can you imagine starting something and giving back tens of millions of dollars? Well, that's what Steve Jobs did. And it, it's interesting that uh, what he was really trying to do was to build uh, um, uh, an image, a market share, and revenue in the long term for that particular product. It turns out that the iPhone today is about 14% of all the smartphone market, and they make about 60% of the profits. Nice work if you can get it. So this is what the, so the payout for this is. So we're going to call this the Garden of Eden. So let's look at an industry you can relate to. It turns out that about 15% of all the CDs sold on the planet are sold by Walmart. Anybody ever been to a Walmart? I'm not the Walmart demographic. I go to Walmart, I feel like I'm in hillbilly hell, you know. I'm from up north. God bless Walmart. I got nothing against them. But, you know, somebody picked the Coca-Cola up and put it on the shelf. I'm that kind of guy, right? Well, it turns out that the Walmart model is huge volume. They only sell 2,000 CDs. Little, mini margins. No variation. I was in Shanghai the other day. The Walmart in Shanghai is just like the Walmart in Philadelphia. It's Walmart. Well, it turns out that somebody sells about 20% of the music on the planet now. And it's these guys. Now, I want you to think about this on a song-by-song -song basis. Not on volume, but song-by-song. -song. Apple made last year 78% of its profits on what's called the deep catalog. Your stuff. Right? Your stuff is where they made all the money. The deep catalog is below 2,000 songs. Now, I want you to get this. So what it means is if you looked at your iPhone, this guy here is into Doris Day. She's into death metal. Who would have guessed? Gangster rap. Your Robert Goulet thing is kind of creepy. But uh, anyway. The notion is we're downloading different kinds of music. Now, the point is on a song-by-song -song basis, Apple's strategy is lower volume. But what are their margins? They start at 100% and go up from that. I'm into 1950s film music. I'm a total nerd, right? You think they're getting 50%? You know, 50%? No, they're getting 80 90% of that, that revenue band on me. And finally, how much variation? Infinite. It's not just different than Walmart. It's the opposite. And we're going to call this the forward position. Apple took the forward position, but over time, the forward position slowly cascades into the aft position, which is where from Walmart is. Does anybody remember who actually got to downloading music first? Anybody remember these guys, 1994? Two years before Apple did. Remember Tower Records? Rest in peace. Had big stores. What was their problem? Their problem was Walmart came in and had better turnkey systems so they could sell the CDs cheaper on the big blockbusters, the Michael Jackson CDs. And it turns out that the internet wasn't fully developed yet, so there was a lot of experimentation. But here's what I want you to think about. On one hand, they had to create standards. On the other hand, they had to create variation. What happens if you have to have standards in part of your organization, your mature part, and variation in the other, is you usually do everything half-assed. And that's what happened to them. Now, I submit to you that this is the challenge most of us have, but I want to say there's another part to the story. Because in 2007, something interesting happened. 
As much as I'm not a fan of Walmart, I am less of a fan of this group, Radiohead. Now I know I'm talking to orchestras. Has anybody heard of Radiohead? They're extremely popular with young people. They're the Grateful Dead of millennials. I hate Radiohead. The lead singer shakes. He's my age. He had one song in 1993 called Creeps. It was like a crappy British bar band song. You know, the songs, there'll be 18 songs on a record. One will be 45 seconds. The other will be 12 minutes. I'm not a fan, right? Two in the morning. I need to eat Doritos. Let's listen to Radiohead, right? Well, Radiohead had the number one record in the world in 2007, and they did something radical. What do you do when your contract is up and you have the number one record in the world? You basically renegotiate your contract and get all the money you can. Radiohead instead created the Priceline model, put their new record on the web and say, pay what you want for this record. Now, young people, do they respect intellectual property? No, they steal like dirt, right? No. But it turns out that 16 million people downloaded the Radiohead record in the final quarter of 2007. Three million of them did it for free. Now, a great group will make about 12% of the remit on a, on a CD. And this is what Radiohead would have gotten, about $2.10. It turned out that Radiohead made $6.86 a download. Radiohead, turns out, wasn't so stupid after all, huh? And what happens in innovation when somebody gets it? What happens when somebody finally gets it right? Everybody follows. Spotify, you know, Google Play, Pandora. Is everybody following us? All of a sudden, the market moves. Now, the point I want to make is I believe that you are Tower Records. This is, I'm trying to speak directly to Brent's point. I believe your problem is, on one hand, you're trying to maximize, optimize, create efficiency on your mature product. But I think it's having an effect on your forward position. It's not that you want to be entirely new. It's that you want to stop strangling the new. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to have to be, be very cognizant of how we innovate is what we innovate. Incidentally, even the best companies in the world, like 3M, have problems with this, where what they'll want is the Apple outcome, but they'll run the practices of Walmart. And that's what most of us do. So there isn't going to be a process, there isn't going to be a core strategy that's going to take you to radical innovation. We're going to have to make some of that up as we go along. If it was that easy, we'd all do it. Now, it's important. This is the IBM study of 3,000 uh, 3, CEOs around the world. These are CEOs. And they asked what constitutes the profile of a, the new leader that's going to make uh, orchestras change. Number one, hungry for change. Are you hungry for change? I'm not that hungry for change. I'm middle-aged, got tenure, right? At some point in your life, you go, I got all my chevrons. I'm not that hungry anymore. But I surround myself with young people who maybe are a little more hungry for change, and I try and enlist them. Uh, the fact that, that uh, we have to be innovative beyond our customer imaginations, as Brendan pointed out. You know, what is, your, what is your first mover customer want? And can you be more innovative than that? Globally integrated. Boy, I hope you see in your town what I see in mine. When I go to the symphony, and I go to the symphony regularly, I see a lot of old people, and I include myself in that. But I also see a lot of people who come from different parts of the world, like my wife, and I see that. And I see that as a great trend. That is a great source of, of, of uh, sust sustenance and support. So on and so forth. But the, what we've got to look at here is we've got to look at how are we going to be creative, is what these, basically these profiles are telling us, and at the same time have execution. How do we have the forward position and the aft position that Brent talked about at the same time? Well, we have to start with a very sobering notion, and that is the cavalry isn't coming. The foundations aren't going to save you. The government isn't going to save you. No one's going to save you. It's like the old Western. Remember when Gabby Hayes or Walter Houston would tumble into the, tumble into the you know, the cavalry isn't coming, the cavalry isn't coming. What it mean? It means you got three choices. You can either run. How's that working out? You can stay and fight. I don't know about you, but whenever I turn and fight, it doesn't work out very well for me. I'm, you know. Or finally, you can deviate. You can change the very things that you think are unchangeable. You can make variations, and I'm going to show you how. So how do we think about growth? Well, the first thing we have to understand is that we really don't make growth happen. We really get on trend. So I want you to think about your, yourself as the smallest Russian nesting doll. 
the next larger Russian, Russian nesting doll is your organization, and the larger one is what's going on in the world. So, you know, if, if we were to say we're going to get all the people in the world who really love orchestras right now, it would be a very bad strategy because the worst growth, growth strategy in the world is to have an increasing share of a decreasing market. Those people are now playing video games, and they're, they're biking, and they're doing other things. So getting more of that market isn't going to help you. You're going to have to get on trend and figure out where these other markets pour into you, where you become relevant to those other markets. You're going to have to fish where there are fish. So we're going to have to think about this both at the individual level, the communal level, and the universal level. So this isn't a, like a Myers-Briggs test. I'm an ENTP or an INFJ. This is like the stock market. It's a bull market or a bear market. It doesn't matter what you are. It matters what the market is. And you have to get that in your head. If you get on trend, you don't have to make growth. You're riding growth like a surfer rides a wave. So step one, what big things are happening in your world? Now, you've seen this model everywhere. I'm one of the developers of this. This has been around for a long time. It's called the Competing Values Framework. There are basically four types of innovation or growth that happens, and they're actually happening at all three levels. So this happens to leaders, it happens to organizations, and it happens to what goes on in communities at large. And I'll explain a little bit about this. What's important about this model and why it's called the competing values framework, it means that when you produce one form of value, it typically destroys another. So let me give you a real example. Has anybody ever bought a brand new car that was kind of had experimental technology on it, like a BMW 7 Series or something pretty radical, or a radical new computer or a radical new device? What happens to quality with that radical new device in the first iteration? It goes down. And why does it go down? It goes down because the more variation you put into something, the harder it is to create a standard process for doing it. The same is true for economies. Did anybody notice what happened to the productivity rates in the U.S. economy when the growth rate went to negative 37.9? For the first time since the Second World War, it went to double digits because we had to do more with less. So what I'm starting out is to say the way, it's not just a, it's not just a style thing about leaders. The way the world works is there is a tension between doing things right and doing things new. There is also a tension between going fast and making something sustainable and holding on to those things that Van Cliborne talked about last night that are deeply sacred and de deeply held by us. So out of these four points of view, there is the point of view of innovation that basically has babies. These are the radical innovators. These are the Apple computers and the Genentechs of the world. They're high risk, high reward. There are types of innovations that are basically keeping everything the way we've typically done it, creating good continuity. These are, the, these are the Toyotas and the McDonald's of the world where some illiterate kid presses a cheeseburger button and somebody simultaneously shoots a cow in Argentina. Bang! And kind of everything in between happens. And somebody's going, it's happening beautifully now. There's the type of innovation that Wall Street loves. Bare knuckle, fist fighting, laissez faire, get after it, get after it, get after it. What do your numbers look like this quarter? They're fast. And then finally, there's a type of innovation where it's communal, we're all going to go together, and we're going to develop this over a period of time. Well, let's look at these individually very quickly. The first form of innovation is the kind of innovation that produces radical innovation and new market growth. And what it means is, in order to do this, we're going to have to have very different kinds of people. We're going to have to eliminate a lot of our rules. We're going to have to take on some risk. But in this position, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bet a little bit and we're trying to bet very wide. And this is the way venture capitalists invest. So you're going to have, instead of one project, five, but they're experiments. And what we're trying to do in this forward position is we're trying to fail fast. We're, it's what we're call, calling accelerate the failure cycle. So what we're trying to do is very quickly run a bunch of small experiments. Now, I'm going to give you some advice later. And one, of the advice, one piece of advice I give you is to fail off Broadway. You know, Lerner and Lowe took Camelot to Toronto, and it was five and a half hours, and Boston four and a half hours, and New Haven three and a half hours. By the time it got to the Ed Sullivan Show, it was, you know, five minutes, and the Kennedys loved the whole thing, right? In the forward position, you don't spend a lot of money or time. 
you hedge and you know you're going to fail, but what you're trying to do is learn very quickly. And in the AF position, which is the opposite, which is trying to produce efficiency and quality, what you're going to do is once something is mature, you're going to try and build systems and processes around this. This is held together by processes where this is held together by vision. So we're going to run a different playbook once something is mature. I'm going to put this together for you in just one second here. When it comes to something like the Gates Foundation, what we're trying to do is we're trying to move very, very quickly on goals. Goals are going to hold us together. We're going to have short-term measures, and we're going to put small teams together. And you can always tell one of these teams because they're named like Go Team, Win Team, Tiger Team, Strike Force. You ever seen those, right? They're run by guys named Chainsaw, Hitman, and the Great White Shark, or something like that, right? But they're very fast, they're very focused, they're very goal-oriented. And the opposite of that is something that you might look at is creating community and creating long-term sustainable culture and competency, which incidentally, almost every group in this room is brilliant at. You're geniuses at this. But the notion is, this takes a long time, and if you follow this point of view, what's going to happen to getting things quickly? If you're going to take, if you've, got, if you've got 18 to 24 months worth of money to stay in business, and you're taking this road, you don't have time for it. Is this making sense to you? Because at the end of the day, there are really only two questions you have to ask, which is how much innovation. Green is going to be a lot more innovation with a lot more risk. Red is going to be a lot less innovation with a lot less risk. And how fast? Blue is going to be very fast, but not very sustainable. And yellow is going to be very sustainable, but not fast. Now, how many feel this tension in their organization, the tension between values and goals? Everybody feel that tension? And we feel the tension between the vision and making something sustainable and the process that you're running. These tensions don't, are not just tensions of I'm one type and you're another type. The tension's a tension because I'm destroying your form of value. Now, I want to add something to this because it's really important. And I know Ann talked about this yesterday. I write a lot about this, the concept of dominant logic. These are dominant logics. And what it basically means is when somebody does something out of dominant logic, we often cast them as immoral. Everybody following us? So, for example, I spent 30 years back and forth in China. I was talking to a guy on a plane the other day, come back from Shanghai. You know what he said? He said, you know, in China, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I looked at him and went, duh, duh. They've been doing this for 4,000 years. They don't need your help, okay? Duh. Well, his point was, that's not right. According to whom? According to your blue point of view being an American? Okay, it's not right. But according to Chinese culture, which is uh, sustainable and been around for a little while and played double jeopardy a few times, um, this is kind of working out for them. So your choice is either you get on board and learn how to deal with this or get out of China, one or the other. And I think this is where we're at. I do a lot of work, in the, uh, obviously, with very large companies. And recently, I'm doing work with some uh, museums and things of that sort. And what's very interesting to me is you have this sense of deep moral commitment, which I love about you. I love that about you. But you also have the sense that when somebody does it differently, it's immoral or they don't understand. You'll take that to the end of your organization if you don't break that mindset. It's not about what, it's about how. Now, how do we put this together? Is it that one organization is one or the other? No, we have to be all of it. But under stress, we can see what an organization really is. Under stress, you will naturally gravitate to your strong hand. So let's do this together. Banks are going to be blue because it's about making money. Remember, it's about making profits, and that's what they do at speed. So when somebody says, Did we see, didn't we see the recession coming? I was an advisor to the Federal Reserve at the time. Yeah. Well, why didn't we hit the brakes? That's not what this point of view does. They don't hit the brakes. They hit the accelerator and think they can make the turn. Right? Is everybody following us? That's their dominant logic. You know, if we're going to look at the arts organizations, they're going to be yellow because it's about sustaining the community, the center of the community, which is good and noble and virtuous. I'm not making fun of it. It's important, and I love you for that. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an honest statement. But I'm also saying there are times that you have to expand your range a little bit. Departments are going to be different. Who are the first people that get fired in a down market? Human resources, because they're yellow. Who are the last people that get hired? Finance, because the human resources people hate them, because they're all, you know, the, 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 the light doesn't reflect in their eye. <laughs> Locations, we talked about China in America. 
So how do companies actually develop? And this comes from a guy named uh, Joseph Schumpeter. And Schumpeter was a, a crazy Czechoslovakian economist, and I, I won't, I'll spare you the sort of the, the lecture on economies, but it turns out that we've had uh, four Nobel laureates in the past uh, 17 years that have basically proven Schumpeter was right. And Schumpeter said, organizations grow like this. When your orchestra was founded, somebody was an entrepreneur. They had a vision, they had an idea, something unique happened. 100 years ago in San Francisco, somebody had an idea. They got a few people together, and what happened was, they, had to, they, they grew for a while, and then they stalled, and somebody came in and said, let's focus the orchestra. We are going to do three things, and we're going to make money, and that's what they did. So all of a sudden, these, these very visionary people were brought in, and somebody had goals that focused the vision. And what Schumpeter says is at that point, at some point, we then reach out to the community, we get the right people in, and we grow really, really fast at this point. And then finally we get administration and we sell tickets and we got to make sure that we filled out all of our I-9 forms and everything's kind of working. And Schumpeter gives us this warning. And it's the same for your organization or economies as it is for a company. And Schumpeter's warning is the seeds of our undoing are sown at the pinnacle of our success. The seeds of our undoing are sown at the pinnacle of our success. And what Schumpeter is saying to you is the very time that the organization is not going to innovate is when everything is going well. And there's a reason why. Schumpeter says this whole thing is going to happen again in this point he calls the point of creative destruction. And why Schumpeter is concerned about this is he has a warning. He has a caution here for you. And his caution is at the very point that your symphony needs to reinvent itself. Every person on your board every way to get money, every project that you're going to launch is subject to a system that's designed to eliminate variation. We have seen the enemy. He is us. John Peter says organizations don't blow up from the outside in. They don't blow up because of iTunes. They blow up from the inside out. They blow up because the way in which they optimize the organization has actually weeded out their ability to deviate. Now, Sean Perry even cautions us worse. He says what happens is when organizations go through this crisis and they start downsizing, remember when the organization started, the, the dominant culture was entrepreneurial and green, and then it became business culture, and then it became this kind of community culture, and then finally it became this administrative culture. And what Schumpeter says is what most organizations do when they finally have to get lean or make changes is the first people who go are the minority groups. They're the people who could actually take you into variation, create innovation for you. The people who stay are the great administrators. Now we've got quiet in the room. Schumpeter says, in fact, the remedy or the medicine you take to fix your institution is, in fact, what's going to kill you. And it turns out when we look at organizations, including Edmund Phelps, Nobel Prize in 2007, it's true. So, here's my antidote for you. Step one, start running projects in the forward position. Where are the crazy people in your organization? You know what I'm talking about, wild-eyed pistol waivers. They don't go to their desk, they know everybody, they don't follow the rules very well, but they're talented, they're extremely talented. <coughs> We're gonna start with them, <coughs> excuse me, we're not going to give them too much money, and we're not going to give them too much time, or we're going to let them experiment. They're going to get under the radar, across the street, wherever you can do it. They're going to work with other people. Find your local college, find your local you know, accelerator, whatever it is in your town, and give these people uh, freedom to tr start trying stuff. And what you're trying to do very quickly is figure out what works and what doesn't work. That's step one. That's going to be your hardest step. You're going to, I'm giving them money? Uh, should I give them a lot of rules? What do I tell the foundation? I don't know. Make something up. And you're going to hide them. You're going to get under the radar. You're not going to report to everybody that somebody's experimenting for the next 30 days. They need room. Just like in a research lab. They're trying to, they're trying to unlock secrets of nature. Then, here comes the hard part. Then you're going to have to have it so that they connect to the body of your organization. Because if you leave greens out too long, they become orphans. Which is a big problem. Now, the middle of the organization has to have a person 
a person in your organization who has a lot of range, particularly between blue and yellow. And I think this is what Brett was, Brett was getting at. We need a person who has the ability to take a radical idea, connect that radical idea to it, something that's going to make money or be viable, achieve your goal, and achieve the values of your organization. It's not a process. It's a person. Who is that person in your organization? Who's, who can take it from the radical into the middle of the organization? Because now what they're doing is they're infecting your organization. This is exactly how it worked at Apple and Google and every place else, and the same in your organization. And finally, only when everything is working do you give it to the systems people and you tie it in and it becomes something you do every day because this is where you're going to make money. This is where you're going to be back on track. This is where the new offering is now as valuable as the old offering. It's not just about money. It's also about what you're trying to do. Now, when we put this all together, I want you to think about it this way. Where you want to launch these experiments is not in the middle of your organization. You want to launch them where you have a crisis. Now, I want to put something out here to this group. Wouldn't it be great if in this group there were 10 orchestras here, 10 symphonies that had a crisis and we could support those symphonies in trying something radical. We could help them be our forward position. Because they don't have anything to lose. right? If they don't get this right, they're going to be out anyway. So let's help them. Let's help them by trying some experimental things. But in a crisis, because they're in a crisis. If you launch this in a place that isn't a crisis, the, the risk and reward isn't going to be reversed. And let's find a couple symphonies that are on a roll. I mean, some people who are just doing some things on a roll, we call this risk capital. You know, it's like being in love. You're just, you have total confidence. Everything goes right. But let's avoid trying to change the symphonies from the middle. Because the middle of any organization is designed to do what to variation? Eliminate it. And this is the key mistake. So find forward position. Find the person who can take it from the forward position to the aft position and start with the 2080 rule. Now, I'm not going to have time to take you through the example that I had of British Petroleum, but the point, the, the moral of the story was the British Petroleum oil disaster really came about because they confused where they were at in the situation. And if you get it wrong, if you're thinking about it the wrong way, and you try and do red things when green things are appropriate, bad things happen. You have to think about this the right way. I like what Steve Jobs said, and that is innovation is mostly about connecting dots. While you're here with the league, please meet with other people and search and reapply best practices. Connect your own dots. It may be time for some of us to start competing in federations, just like we do in businesses. After the recession, a lot of businesses had to work together in ways that they never did before. Why not symphonies? My final point. Leave room for the stuff you don't know now. The only difference between leading and leading innovation is very simple, and that is this. Leading is about achieving what you want to achieve. Leading innovation is about building the bridge as you walk over it. Take advantage of the things that emerge, and remember the DeGraff hypothesis. Right? Your ability to innovate is inversely related to the number of plans, strategies, and stupid PowerPoint slides you make about innovation. Just do it. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it says here I'm supposed to ad lib some synthesis of the two presentations we just heard. I give up. Um, <laughs> let, let, let's just say we heard two wonderful presentations giving us a lot to think about and to work on during the rest of the conference. Um, I need to make a correction. Uh, earlier today, uh, I announced the, the incorrect name of our flute player, and that uh, correct name is Abonse Thomas, and she's principal flute of the Knoxville Symphony, an alumnus of Greater Dallas Youth Orchestra and the New World Symphony in Miami. So apologies, Abonse, and um, glad we got it right finally. Okay, so 
Um, please join us for coffee and a snack in the exhibit area just outside this room and for a short break before heading to your next meeting. Oh, time for another plug. You can still show your appreciation for the experiences you're having here at the League. And we will show our appreciation to you with a free gift. And it, it's very close to the exit of these doors, our appreciation center. So don't forget to stop there. Thank you very much.